have something really good, a hot topic in the news this week. has been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate real, real stories. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. I'm excited to start the new year off in 2020, January 15th, 2020. Can you believe that? Wow. 2020. And I have uh, two great gentlemen here with me tonight. I have my routine co-host, Mr. Damian Walker with Sir Jobs and all around volunteer, uh, formerly incarcerated, telling his story, helping inspire and show that you can, there's life after prison. And then I have my really, really good friend, James Bell, who now works for the City of Houston Community Reentry Network Program. And he's here to tell you about the City of Houston and the program that they have to help people. So James, let's take it, take it on. Tell us what's going on. Tell us, thank you for coming. Well, absolutely, and thank you for having me. Damon, it's always good to see you. Yes, sir. I'm excited to be here to talk about the City of Houston Community Reentry Network Program. Uh, first thing I'd like to say, I'm just happy that I live in a city where we have a mayor who actually supports and envisions uh, this program. And we also have a director, and Mr. Steve Williams, who is the director of the health department. Interestingly enough, we fall under the health department. A lot of people ask the question, well, why would the reentry program be under the health department? Well, because we see reentry also as a public health issue. We understand that uh, individuals coming out of incarceration, uh, there's a lot of health issues that if, if they're uh, not some type of intervention made, they exacerbate and it gets worse, and that becomes a, a burden on the taxpayer. There's food deserts, and there's a lot of resources that we provide for them. So about the program, we've been in existence, existence since 2008. Uh, we're located at 4802 Lockwood in the heart of Kashmir. And what we do, we specialize in providing a seamless delivery, wraparound uh, delivery of services to those who have been recently incarcerated and recently released. Uh, so what type of services are those? Well, we do behavioral health assessments. We do mental health assessments. What we find is that a lot of individuals being released from prison, the first thing they want is a job, which is good, this is great. We want people to get jobs, we want people to sustain those jobs. But what we find is that 35% of individuals who are being released has some type of mental health diagnosis. A lot of times they don't know it and they don't have any type of treatment. So once we do in our assessments and identify uh, what those issues are, we can make the appropriate referrals. And we find out if those referrals are made uh, in a fast and a speedy uh, fashion, then they, they can get the help that they need. So at the uh, at our reentry lo uh, program located 4802 Lockwood, we have on-site counselors and caseworkers. So once we link them with a caseworker, we find out what their needs are. So once we do the assessments, we link them to gold card access. We set up wellness exams for them because we want to make sure that they are. Uh, they're mentally and physically fit for work. What I really enjoy about the program is the cognitive track that we have. Uh, we recently adopted uh, an evidence-based practice uh, curriculum uh, uh, developed by the National Institute of Corrections that shows that when uh, this uh, curriculum is facilitated, it reduces uh, recidivism significantly. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about recidivism, when I speak of recidivism, we're talking about the rate in which individuals return back to incarceration. So that curriculum is 12 weeks. And a lot of times the client would tell us, I can't do 12 weeks. And I said, well, think about this. I'm looking at your record and you did 25 on a 30. You did 25 years, 30 years, 15 years. When was the last time you actually invested in yourself? We're talking about 12 weeks here four days a week from 12.30 until 4.30. Think about it. And once we get them to actually think about investing in themselves, they do. 
What days of the week is it? Yes, it's Mondays through Thursdays from 12.30 to 4.30, okay? And so we also have a partnership with the Texas Workforce Commission and SIR, where the Texas Workforce Solutions will come into our location twice per month. We work on uh, workforce development, job readiness, uh, mock interviews, things of this nature to actually get them ready for the interview. What I'm really excited about is that those individuals who are returning from prison within the last three years, there is funding available for them. They can actually take advantage of forklift certification, mm -hmm. warehouse management, welding, construction, trades of this nature. Because what we find is that, yes, you do have a criminal background that can be a barrier to employment, but we also find is that they don't have a job skill. Mm -hmm. And we have partners in the community who are willing to take a chance on a returning citizen, that's what we call them, if they have uh, what we call uh, job skills. Yeah. So it's been very successful. Wow. Okay, so and does the city of Houston fund this or is this some type of grant? It, it's grants, right? But as far as the funding, that, that's coming from uh, the state of Texas, TDCJ, okay. yes. Okay. So the, the program, the whole program, Community Reentry Network, is the TDCJ? Not the whole work, uh, the whole program is just a vocational component. Okay. So our funding comes from uh, CDBG uh, funding, which is a grant, Community Development Block Grant. And what we used to call, well, it's still called the 1115 waiver, which is uh, federal funds from Medicaid that allows you to expand the way those monies are utilized. Okay. All right, so let's say someone comes out and they get, participate in your 12-week program. How do they do that? Do they come to this address at 4802 Lockwood and fill out an application, or do y'all talk to them? Yes. I, if I send someone there, what would be the first thing, first step? Good question. So the first thing they do there, check in with the receptionist. They will call us and let us know that a, a client has come here for reentry. At that time, one of my counselors or caseworkers will meet them and do an intake package. We will fill out uh, various documents, explain to them about the program, and see if it's something they really want to do. Okay. How many people are sitting there standing by for people to walk in? You know, and that's the <laughs> dilemma we have. I wish there were a waiting list. Currently, we enroll approximately 500 to 550 people per year. We would like to double that number if we can. So we're going right now to the parole divisions, the Texas workforce uh, locations, probation, uh, churches in the community, anyone uh, who has an ear, uh, ear to listen. And so who do we serve? Any person who's been touched by the criminal justice system, whether they spent one day in the county jail, 20 years in prison. They got out yesterday. They got out five years ago. We want to meet them. We want to talk to them. But you said it has to be within three years. For the, for the vocational piece. The vocational piece. Yes. But to participate in our program, it could be any, any person. Okay. So, so someone comes in, they talk to a counselor, um, and so there's counselors just sitting there waiting for them to come in? Yes, the okay, counselors are doing casework because they have clients that they serve every day. And every day there's a counselor who's on duty. Okay. So when the person comes in, we assign him or her to the duty counselor and they do the intake and enroll them in the program. So it's one person working at desk basically? Yes. Per day? Yes. I gotcha, okay, and so when you take them through the 12 week program, do they have to pick what program they want to learn like forklift or CDL or construction or do y'all have some type of assessment that says what their aptitude is and what they'd be better at? Yes. Yeah, so the first thing we do once they complete the 12-week program then we move them to the workforce development piece because we want to do a vetting. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we have the cognitive component done first. We want to make sure that thinking is on point, right? And once they've done that then we move them into the vocational track based on assessment of what their skill sets or, or what their career path may be. Okay. Well, Damien, let's jump on in. So, Damien, well, t remind me of when you got out of prison. Uh, July 20th, 2010, I was released. 
after 17 years of incarceration. July 20th, 2010, after 17 years. Wow. So, wow, no, da Damien is the poster child. <laughs> and uh, and you were just a baby when you went in. How old were you? 16. I was 16 when I went in. I was 33 when I was released. Wow, that's deep, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, that's my, that's, I'm proud of him. So how did you know or have the wherewithal to get involved with the City of Houston program? I think I was at a transitional facility, uh, Gary Lane, um, Fertile Ground at the time. Right. Uh, and then I was working, I came from a IFI Caravans unit, um, so Caravans. So it was like, you know, this is a, one of the agencies that you need to go to um, after you get your, all your documentation. And um, I think not long after I was released, um, I actually went and partook in the program in 2010. And I mean, I completed it. And then we were going to Cashmere and we were going to Trinity Gardens, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was an excellent experience. And it, it, it really helps people like me that came out adjust back to society. Because mm -hmm. not only are you in the group uh, with formerly incarcerated men and women, but formerly incarcerated men and women were also the instructors too. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can kind of tell you how you need to adjust, you know, advise you. But then the counselors, I think that was a component that you miss in prison. You don't get a lot of counseling. Um, so if there are certain issues that you have that the health department can actually look at, uh, because it is a mental health issue sometimes when you come out of prison, people, you know, you just don't uh, know how to adjust and, and things are sometimes heavy on you. And sometimes the right person can actually uh, look at you and ask the correct question. Right. And I think that's one thing that the, uh, the, um, the program was able to do for me and a couple of other people was um, show us that, that, you know, we are citizens and, you know, you can go to work, but right. you need to adjust a little bit. So slow down a little bit. How was uh, your patience? You know, like uh, James was just telling us, it's a four days, 12.30 to 4.30, that commitment for mm -hmm. 12 weeks. How did you adjust to that commitment? For me, uh, my, my personal, I was on a GPS monitor. Mm -hmm. So what, where else can I be? <laughs> <laughs> where else can I go, you know? Right. So I get to be out late in the afternoon, you know, start my day kind of late. Uh, so for me, it was okay. I actually used to go to the uh, Shipley's, even though I wasn't supposed to get off my monitor <laughs> track. Uh, because it was on a bus ride, I would go to the Shipley's and I would buy a Shipley's. So it really helped me adjust. And because initially, I, I was only allowed out, seemed like, in the daytime. Mm -hmm. With you guys, I was able to come back later on in the evening and kind of see how the city was moving later on in the evening. Um, and it was just a great thing because I was at the transition facility in Third Ward. So we were in Cashmere, Trinity Gardens uh, back then. So just because I got an opportunity to go and be a part of certain programs, it was great for me. Wow, okay, well that's good. And so what would you do in the morning? So this was your job at the time. Uh, it wasn't a job, it was just, I would job search. Sometimes I would go to work for solutions or, um, I had a horticulture trade, so at the transition facility, I would do the yard. Okay. So I would use uh, my skills that I had learned, or I used to help people with resumes too, because I had a degree when I graduated, so I could help the other men that were at the transition facility um, with things. And by this time, I hadn't enrolled at U of H yet, but I was looking to see what I wanted to do. So I was researching the things that I needed to do to enhance uh, my release. How many people were, approximately, how many people were in the program with you when you did the 12 week program? I don't remember, yeah, because it was. It but was it seemed like it was a lot of people, it, it seemed like it was seemed like, like five no. of us. It, because it was us that were in, but you know, they, people were always coming in, because back then it was, there was a lot. Right. It seemed like there was a lot back then, and uh, again, we were at both facilities. We were at Trinity Gardens and at uh, Cashmere, so it always seemed like a lot. But one thing then, and I know that happens now, we actually helped each other. Right. That we know with jobs, or I didn't know how to use a computer that well, so people would help me uh, learn how to use computers and the cell phone. I really didn't know how to text and stuff like that. So it was the simple fact that it was those of us that were released, but also those that were already in the program. Uh, so to me, just thinking about it now, it seemed like a lot. It probably wasn't a lot. I just was overwhelmed. Uh, but it seemed like there was a lot of guys and, and uh, women that, that helped me throughout the program. Did you take advantage of one of the vocational tracks? Back then, they didn't have that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the back then. Because um, it was just two years old. The program was just yeah. two years old. So what's happening now is, is totally, totally amazing. Back then, it was more so of 
resume building, some job interview skills, some group settings, uh, being in a group with um, some of the some of the other participants. So it was mo it was mainly employment because that's what TDC was really focused on mm -hmm. and still kind of focused on was employment. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you are prepared for employment and then going to get jobs. So we did get some job referrals. We got some program referrals for Operation ID and some dental stuff. So it was mainly adjusting. Now it's because I go and talk that now. Right. Um, so now it's it's totally, totally different. And I think that what the guys and girls have now uh, helps them a lot more than what I receive. Uh, but again, I received a lot. But it's just amazing what they have now. Wow. Okay, James, we'll add to that. Yeah, and just to add to that, also, you know, I spoke earlier about us having a, uh, a seamless delivery of wraparound services, a one-stop shop. So you can come to one location and get your needs met, for instance. Uh, since we are part of the health department, we have immunization teams that comes there and they make sure they get the immunizations every two weeks. Now, we don't mandate that, but we strongly encourage it. Also, for those who live on a bus line, we provide bus passes. If those, uh, we have clients who do not live on a bus line, but they have access to a vehicle with insurance, then we provide them with a gas card. If they get an interview, we have a partner who will suit them up, either whether it's a lady or a man, career gear, address for success. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is eliminate any barrier that would keep a person from being successful. And that's what reentry is. We're trying to help them successfully transition back in the community so they don't go back to prison. And there's a strong need, and I like something you said earlier, Vivian, about the commitment. Mm -hmm. And what we are finding is that once they are released, they want everything right now. Right, right. And before the segment started, uh, Mark was kind enough to let me watch a video of uh, what happens when a juvenile, a is, juvenile arrested. is arrested. Yeah, I had uh, Mark do that, and I had, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, John Jordan. Yes, I do. Uh, and I asked, John Jordan's over juvenile now. Right. He took Hans Nielsen's place until Hans retired, and we said, let's do a video so we can, t you know, teach the educators right. what y'all are doing the HISD and all the police, right. what y'all are doing when y'all incarcerate these kids. Right. When y'all, you know, they have a school fight, instead of mm -hmm. handling it at the school right. by letting them do three days suspension like we used to right. do, when they, make, when they put handcuffs on these kids. And so John was nice enough to use his own child <laughs> and kind of, and you know, got as many participants as he could to kind of show you how it, how it looks. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? And it's, it's real because... We have a 20-minute version and we have a short version. You probably saw the short version. I saw the short version. Mm -hmm. And... The first thing I thought about was my own son, Austin. Right. And I'm like, and although it was an actor, and he did a very good job acting as well, a young kid. <laughs> no, uh, I'm like, kidding. that guy was good. Yeah, he was good. But I thought about my son. Why, mm -hmm. Do you know why you're being arrested? Mm -hmm. And we lived at, at the reentry location. I've seen young men, come, who, who, well, they were young when they got into the system, mm -hmm. at 16 years old, one as young as 11. Mm -hmm. Certified as an adult, 16, goes into the prison system, comes out 28 years later. Mm -hmm. So we talk about that's damn near Damien. Yes, we talk about 17 years later. He 17 was certified years and went in at 16. No, yeah. he was a juvenile. Wow, yeah. he was certified. That's why he did. He went from 16 years old to 33. That's more than half of his life. More than half. He of stayed his life. in 17 years. He was only 16 when he went there. But like you stated earlier, and Damien is a poster child. He's a poster for child. a person when you. You have somebody who believes in you mm -hmm. and pushing you, and that's what we do. We navigate. I do believe that people, by far, you know, Vivian, you and I worked together uh, when I was at the probation department. I do believe that most people, many, many people, really want to do the right thing. Yeah. Sometimes they just need a little help. guidance, a little help. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we do. Uh, my staff, what I love about the program, 100% of the participants are not court ordered. Mm -hmm. nor are they mandated by stipulations of parole or uh, 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 probation. You said 100%? 100% are not stipulated to be there. Mm -hmm. They come there because they want to help. They've heard that if we can just get the cashmere, there are people there who care about you. Mm -hmm. And I do believe programs are great, systems are wonderful, but it's relationships that change, help people change mm -hmm. behavior. And my staff is phenomenal, mm -hmm. and you can attest to this, Dave. Uh, I agree. Uh, not because I'm sitting here, but because it's a fact mm -hmm. that we care about people. We're not going to judge you. We're going to meet you where you are, and your success becomes our success. And it's when we work together, and that's why we are called the Community Reentry Network Program. It's community. 
it's the community pulling their resources together because there's some things that we're not good at. Employment, mm -hmm. workforce development, that's why we have partners who yeah. do those type of things. Uh, you don't want me to give you immunization. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we have partners who do those type of things, right? Now, I can dress you, yeah. you know, but we still have partners who do those things. So when people come there and we take the holistic approach, we work from the inside out, and then we have success stories like Damien. Mm -hmm. I can tell you of a young man who was arrested at age 11, certified at 16, did 28 years in prison. We're talking serious arrested development. So all his survival skills he learned in were in prison. Mm -hmm. So Damien think, too. yes, mm -hmm. but watch this. Any behavior that's learned can be unlearned. Very true. It takes restructuring. And that's what we do. It takes time. And we tell them all the time, it is a process. It's not going to happen over time. Now, what Damien was talking about earlier is peer support. Damien can go into our amphitheater and facilitate a group and do a great job because Damien can speak into dark situations that you or I, Vivian, can't speak into. Sure. We've never been to the places that you've been to. And they're going to listen to you because you can relate, right? So you're going to touch the heart. And so when Damien comes back and says, hey, I was sitting right where you are right now, and this is what happened to me. Yes. I came to the reentry program, they worked with me, and look at me now. So he's a success story, and we have lots and lots and lots of success stories. Well, how's the young man that was certified, went in at 11 and certified, how's he doing? Great question. He came by the office at least three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. He has this huge uh, super power stroke, four, 350, mm -hmm. Uh, he's doing oil, he's in the oil business right now, doing a phenomenal job. And what I love about it is when they become successful, mm. they don't forget where they came from. Yeah. They come back. Sure. And they, the first thing they do, hey, when you get out of this program, call me. I got a job for you. So he is doing great. Uh, our recidivism, after three years, is 13.5%. Oh, that's great. 13.5%. Yes. So we do believe that with evidence-based practices, the human component, you put those things together, you can have a positive outcome. Now you said the recidivism rate after three years, so it's higher at some other juncture, what is that? Yes, uh, so statewide it's like 38.5%. Those individuals coming out of a state jail facility is high, it's as high as 65%. So we do believe that we have something special at the Kashmir Multi-Service Center, a home of the Community Reentry Network program. We want to build on it. We want more people to hear about it. That's why we go into every place uh, that will allow us entrance. We go in there because it's, it's a very good secret in the heart of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And the more people hear about it, I hope the phones blow up tomorrow. Yes. I really do. Uh, at 832-393-5467. <laughs> What's the okay. phone number? 832-393-5467. If you want to catch the Metro there, the number three and the number 80 bus will get you there. It, it, it's right outside the center. Yeah. So again, if you say, you, oh yeah, here's some more great news, Vivian. You're going to like this. And, 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 and Damien, you can appreciate this. We have partners that... We will provide you, up, our partners will provide you up to 60, what, 65 pounds of fresh produce yes. and a meat. That partner was there today, one day a week. Once you come to the program, we give you a card where you can access the Houston Food Bank food pantry twice per month. So we're talking about three times per month, 65 pounds of fresh produce and a meat, mm -hmm. just from being in our program. So if it's food, we got you. If it's clothes, we got you. If it's employment, we can assist you. If it's anger management, we have that for you. If you're trying to get your driver's license back because of suspended driver's license, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a certified drug offender education specialist on staff who's certified to teach that, that class. If you need thinking for a change, we have it. If you need a GED, we have a partner on site. If you have an apartment that's listed in your name, our partner will pay $650 per month towards your rent and $250 per month towards your utilities. So again, what's the excuse? You got to tell me more than you have a felony because I know people with felonies who was doing very good. You just have to believe in yourself and let those who specialize in this type of work, let us help you. 
Wow. Nice so uh, how long have you been doing this work? Okay, so I've been doing this work uh, for two years. Okay, but when did you leave the Harris County? Because uh, James and I worked together at Harris County for many years when I was a defense attorney and he was a court liaison officer, probation officer, right. basically. When he was the man, you go, you're in court and you want to got a good probation, you had to go talk to James Bell because he's <laughs> the one writing those conditions up and telling you what to do and where you got to report and what you better do <laughs> and uh, violate your probation, too. He's the one typing up that motion to revoke okay, your probation. Okay. Now, I was a big advocate, yeah. and my thing was that people would ask me, what, what do you do when I work with the probation department? I say, well, my job... I keep people out of jail and prison. I'm very good at it, but you got to listen to me. Trust me when you don't even trust yourself. When it comes to these conditions of probation, follow my lead and you won't go wrong. So I, I retired from Harris County Community Supervision uh, and Corrections Department after 27 years. You worked at 27 years. years. Oh, wow. I, I retired. Uh, my last day was November 27th of 2017. Mm -hmm. You get done 27 years. 27 years. Wow. And I started with, I was fortunate to get on with the city of Houston. And my first day was December 4th, 2017. Oh, wow. You didn't even take a break. No. And the way it happened, I wasn't even looking for it. Wow. That's why I know I'm supposed to be here. Yes. All my life, I've always been an advocate, been a servant for the people. I believe in serving. Mm -hmm. And... I was fortunate enough, the good Lord allowed me to uh, establish a lot of relationships in the community. Right. And what he was saying to me, I need for you to take everything I've allowed you to learn, all the people I've allowed you to meet, and I need for you, because see, you're out there and on, at the west office, off, uh, you know, nice out there, right? You was out there on the south side. I need for you to take all your experience and I need you to go hang out in the garden. Mm -hmm. Not the Garden of Eden. <laughs> <laughs> Cashmere garden. <laughs> and you're going to serve people that you never served before. And you're going to help them get better. I don't do it by myself. I don't try to take credit for it. I have an amazing team mm -hmm. of counselors, trainers, a division manager, deputy directors, a director, and a mayor who supports what we do, which makes my job so easy, uh, yeah. so easy, especially when people come and no one's making them come. Right, 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 right. And I enjoy your enthusiasm uh, for <laughs> what you do because, you know, you it, it's fun serving people, but it can be disheartening sometimes yeah. because, yeah. you know, it's hard dealing with a population sometimes that is depressed. Yes that has to come back into a system that yes. they don't understand. Yes, I agree. And, uh, so, and, and, and a lot of times, some of them are negative. I, I don't know if the ones you have are negative, but I know a lot of people I work with, have, or used to work with, were very negative. I guess maybe because I was a criminal defense lawyer, so yeah. I'm working with people when they're in trouble mm -hmm. or have to get out of trouble mm -hmm. or soon to be getting out of trouble. And so, you know, they feel defeated. Right. Yeah. So uh, I guess with you, at least they're out so they can be optimistic. Yes, yes, and, and we embrace that optimism and we build on it. We see value in them when they don't see value in themselves. Good. And sometimes I like to think that I want to contaminate you with goodness, with positivism. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you come into our environment, we hear people say it all the time. It's just something about mm -hmm. your staff. It's something I feel here. They are very inviting. And again, I will brag on them seven days a week and twice on Sunday because, see, it's passion. It's the passion that drives the chain, which fuels the train. And my staff has a lot of passion and it's contagious. And people, even a dog knows the difference from being kicked and tripped over. Mm -hmm. So when people come into your environment and they feel that positive energy, they want to be part of it. Example, we had a young man, well, three young men who completed our program. And I noticed they would always hang around the center. And so I had him in the office one day, we were talking. I said, I got a question for you. I know as you finished your program, you know, two weeks ago, and I know you're still looking for a job and everything, doing applications at the computer lab, but I noticed you, you hang around here a lot. He said, Mr. Bell, the reason we hang around here a lot is at one time we were tearing down this community. Now we building up this community. And you all have given us so much. You've given us hope. Wow. So we feel like we have to give something back. And I realized in this business, the only thing worse than not giving people hope 
is giving them false hope, mm -hmm. making false promises. Mm -hmm. We don't guarantee people jobs. I know people graduating from college every day. No it. one's guaranteeing them jobs. But what we do guarantee to you is that you will be better leaving this program than you were when you came into this program. You're going to have some skills, some soft skills, some life skills, and some cognitive skills. So you know how to maneuver when you get on that job. It's one thing to get a job, but it's another thing to sustain that job right. and to move up in that job. So that's what we do, and uh, I hope they can feel my energy. This is, <laughs> this is what we do. We, we love to serve people. We consider ourselves servants. Uh, we're paid by the taxpayers. The taxpayers are getting their money because we're going to give it 100% every day. That's one thing that's true. Like uh, one time <clears throat> we were working with a client and uh, the client wasn't satisfied. And so Mr. Bell felt that it was some false hope going there. So he called my cell phone. And he said, Doc, that's how I knew it was serious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he kind of laid into me a little bit. I said, Mr. Bill, I'm going to find out for you. So that's one thing about him and his program. He want to make sure that, that the clients, because they're sometimes unstable situations. Yeah, right. So you want to make sure that it's not that false hope because, again, <clears throat> you're the person that they're trusting. They've trusted a lot of people. I've trusted a lot of people, you know, our whole life. And sometimes even though if you're the, the worst or you made some bad decisions, that's all you have is trust when you're trying to change. And if you break somebody's trust that's trying to change, like it's difficult to get that back or they can go either way. So that's one thing that he is serious about. If, if, if you say you're going to do something, your agency, he's going to give you a call. Yeah, he's he, he going he gonna to call to the top. He ain't going to just call. I'm at the bottom. But he's called to the top. And I've got called and means, uh, Mr. Did you talk to Mr. Bear? Yes, I did talk to Mr. Bear. Mm -hmm. So from the CEO. So that's outstanding. I want to tell a story too. Uh, so I graduated the program 2010. I got okay. out of 2010, graduated 2010. When I started working for Sarah, and I didn't go back a lot. Okay. I didn't go back a lot. When I started working for Sarah, um, I had to go back to the Casual Multi Service Center. So this is 2018. Right, but you had been a top car salesman. I, had been a, I, was, I was selling cars, oh, yeah. making money. I was doing my thing. I was doing my thing. Uh, so I was, they told me to go to Casper Multi Service Center for outreach. So Veronica and I came. Okay. And uh, I didn't know where I was going because it was eight years. Okay. I didn't even remember. So I turned off 610 and Veronica was already there. And a uh, true story. I turned off 610. I'm supposed to be making a left at the light. Mm -hmm. I made a right because I saw that bus stop. Mm -hmm. I couldn't control myself. I started crying in my car. Whoa. Because I said, man, look where I came from. I'm mm. in a fully loaded car with all type of leather panoramic. Right. And I'm like, I was holding the wheel and I couldn't, I couldn't stop crying. I just saw the bus stop. I'm like, I used to catch the bus wow. right there with my backpack. I used to get off my ride and go to the store and get soda when I was, wasn't supposed to. And I turned right and I was just going down the street and I just could not stop crying because that bus stop reminded me because I saw that whole area because I hadn't saw the area in eight wow. years and I was just so going 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 not saying that I forgot where I came from mm -hmm. but it was a simple fact of I had moved so right. fast and into you know certain successes and so when I got in there it was just I was so happy I was so happy when I got in. I think I came to your office and I saw Latasha La and I didn't recognize her she right. didn't recognize me but I we looked that. at each other yeah we looked at each other Latasha um is uh division manager division manager mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, she wasn't, but she worked there then. Right. So this is eight years, and I haven't seen her. But she used to counsel me. She used to give me bus calls. And when I saw her, I was like, I know her. And then she looked at me, and we looked at each other for a long time. Yeah. And I just didn't remember. Then afterwards, so, but ever since then, we've been hugging every time we see each other. Because yeah. she's proud of me, and I'm thankful for that, too. So wow. it's, it's been a, like a... It, the, the impact, like a lot of other programs in Houston and the surrounding area, uh, the impact is great and it's far reaching. Right. And sometimes, like I say, you'll never get to hear how you help somebody or you'll never get to hear how you influence somebody. But the simple fact is that's why you, you don't do it to, to know. You do it because that's what you're supposed to be exactly. doing. And, and I want to thank Damien because when we did have that issue, I called Damien that morning, I think within 40, 30 to 40 minutes, I got two or three emails like that. Got a phone call from Damien and said, Miss Bell, I took care of that. <laughs> two or three emails followed that, so thank you for that. Yes, and I'm reminded of something also since you said telling stories. And, and Vivian, when we worked in court, you remember a judge, uh, you know, boot camp was big back in the day. Oh, yeah. mm. <clears throat> and all the research showed that it didn't work. I mean, you know, yeah, uh, you they, take a, they loved it. They loved it. You, you take a Judges young lady. Loved it. loved it. You know, that's scared straight, right? Mm. You take a young lady who's been verbally abusive, abused all her life, and a young man who's been 
physically and verbally abused all their life. You put them in a setting, you got a drill instructor yelling, research says that don't work. Well, I learned something. I think that's when I had my aha moment. Uh, that there was a young man who had been stipulated to the Harris County boot camp. And back then, in that day, the boot camp was 120 days long. That's how long and so we And we worked together back in the 90s. Back yeah. in the so 90s. I remember everybody from West Airport going to boot camp. So y'all since yeah. us, oh, yeah. some of my homeboys got sent us too. There. I remember. Ton of people, right? <clears throat> and, and, and then the, the waiting list was, you had to wait like three months in the county jail. Yeah, just before you could even get go. There. Mm. Right? So there was this young kid, I can't remember his name, but I'm going to call him Bobby because he reminded me of Bobby from King of the Hill. Bobby, that's my boy, right? <laughs> yeah. And Bobby had been there for a long time. He'd been recycled twice, which means if you mess up, you start all over again. And I learned that Bobby, biological parents had been killed in a car accident and his adoptive parents were in prison for traffic and drugs. Mm. I learned later that Bobby had been diagnosed with bipolar and major depression. And I, I noticed that on Wednesdays when we had mail day, that was the day that they would get mail. Bobby never got any mail or anything like that, right? Never. And I noticed, now, now where, were, where was he when you were noticing this? Was he already in the program? He was or was in the he program. The he, was, he was at the boot camp on a task. And you were working center. there? I was doing life skills out there, okay. going out there in the evenings, teaching week. life skills. I see. Right, three times a week. <clears throat> After you left downtown, boy, you were hitting it, weren't you? Like the living, got, yeah, got to bills sure. to pay. A wife and two kids. Dad, you hey, remember, you're right. You no, know, I, you know, I know him. <laughs> so by picture there. anyway. Yeah. I know him by picture. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so I'm out there, and, and, and one time, the guy, I noticed that Bobby started acting out. But Bobby would always sit right next to me in the barracks. And the guy would say, Mr. Bell, would you please let him say his poem? He wanted to say a poem. And because... Bobby was acting out, they would thrash him and all that kind of stuff. Long story short, Bobby said a poem. And this poem was recited back in, I would say, 1992. Here it is, 2020. I remember like it was yesterday. I can see wow. Bobby sitting right there. Wow. And it, it tells you we really don't know what's going on in a person's life mm -hmm. until you get to know what's mm -hmm. going on in a yeah. person's life. Yeah, he was in pain. He was in pain. He was in pain. In the, in the, I know. You know, I dealt with death as a child, so I, I understand wow. he was in pain. A lot of pain that I never imagined. Yeah. But the poem goes like this. It was called a letter, L-E-T-T-E-R, because he never got letters. Mm -hmm. It goes like this. You can never know what a letter can mean until you've been where I've been and seen what I've seen. Mm. I'm confined to a world behind four walls where nobody writes and nobody calls. Mm. I wake up, I fall asleep and I wake up alarmed that my family and friends have all been harmed. Mm. Just dreams I realize as I come to my senses and look out the window at chain link fences. Mm. Mail day, they say, but none for me today. Not a letter, a note, or even a card. When nobody writes, it makes my time so hard. So take this time and write me a letter. To you it's not much, but it makes me feel better. Mm. You can never know what a letter can mean until you've been where I've been, seen what I've seen. Wow. That's deep. That's deep. And that's deep that you remembered that boy. Yeah. That, that's, but that's, that says it all. Changed my life. Mm -hmm. it, says, it says it all. We see a spin number, a Sieges number, a SID number, a FBI number, a DPS number, a HPD number, a Harris County Sheriff Office number. Mm -hmm. So when you're in the system, you're in the system. Mm -hmm. But I see a person. Mm -hmm. I see a, somebody's son, somebody's daughter, mother, grandfather. Until we start seeing people like that and start treating people like the humans that they are, treating the, the behavior, then we're not. That's where it starts. That's why we need people in our program. Because we believe that a person has the capacity to change. We believe the capacity is there. We want to help them make that change. And let me tell you what, what, uh, something, I don't know if you know this about me, but one of the things I can relate to, and one of the reasons why I was so passionate about the criminal law that I did, right. because my banking had been in business, so I could have gone and made a bunch of money right. as a business lawyer, but I got somehow hoodwinked into doing prosecution and then <laughs> did, spent 22 years doing criminal defense. But one of the things I was so passionate about was because my, you know, my life could have been their life. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. my mother died young. I lived with different relatives, basically mm -hmm. not formally, but it was the same as foster family. Mm -hmm. And uh, at 17, I just said, hey, 
I was, I'm from San Antonio. I, I had figured out an escape route. And so it was like, just take me to Houston. It's three right. hours away. I'll figure out how to live. And I, in the dorms, I was at University of Houston uh, in 76 when I came here. In the dorms, I'm living with all these people who are loved, who are coddled. Mm. I don't get a phone call. I don't get a letter. Wow. They get care packages. Mm. On the weekends, they're all sneaking back to Fort Worth or Dallas to see their little high school boyfriends at a nine <laughs> college. I'm sitting there answering the phone, you know, lying for all of them, thinking, oh, I wish somebody called me. Yeah. And I had seen everything, you know, when my mother died, I had been in the street, seen the dope, seen people get killed, you know, just by the grace of God, I took a different turn. Mm -hmm. I was doing the same things they were doing, but by the grace of God and my mother being my angel, yes. and I know watching me and wanting more for me, mm -hmm. I had an epiphany as a young girl, just doing mm -hmm. some wrong stuff. Something came over me and I think I <laughs> thought, started hallucinating and mm -hmm. thought her, I saw my mother in a casket with wings, wow. just kind of trying to speak to me. And I said, you know what? Today's got to be the day I stop. Today yeah. has got to be the day I'm not gonna do drugs. I'm not gonna do wrong. I am going to be the person that she thought I was when she died and left me. And uh, I asked a few of my aunts were beauticians, so I asked a few of their customers who were teachers, what can I do? Mm -hmm. How can I escape this? And they told, a couple of them told me, and I followed that route. It might not have been the best route, but it was the only route right. I knew. Right. And uh, always thought of her as my angel watching mm -hmm. me and me trying to make her proud. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I had to kind of realize, but you know, I'm a little smarter than most people. And I'm right. a deep thinker, but I was thugging out. Uh, but I, I had to think about you know, you can change your life and you can change your destiny. And I had to think of my mother as not being mad at the world mm -hmm. for her dying and angry because everybody had something that I didn't have, which, you know, there's a lot of anger. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had to say, you know what? She's my angel in heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus died so we could live. Right. So maybe she died so I could live. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because we lived in a very violent environment. And so I said, I, she died so I could live. So I just thought of her as my Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had to like reprocess right. in my mind how to live with this and not be angry. And I was always very sensitive to the women and the men incarcerated and mm -hmm. used to spend a lot of time with them and people didn't know why, but this was why. Right. You know, after church, I would go and I would take the sermon notes mm -hmm. at Windsor Village wow. up to the church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. You know, I did that for years, ministering them, helping men mm -hmm. be men, mm -hmm. you know, people who, I don't know how to make a man be man, but mm -hmm. you know, if they've never had, they had parents in prison, right. yeah. they're thinking you got to rob somebody to get exactly. enough mm -hmm. money to get McDonald's to feed their kids or themselves and not thinking there's another way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I spent a lot of time, I guess, basically teaching people life skills yeah. or or to find something inside of them to make them want to be better and make mm -hmm. somebody be proud of them, even if that person's in heaven. Right. You know At what I'm saying? At this time, were you still learning your life skills, though, because you still were young, too? It took me years. It probably took me until I was 30 to get over my mother died. And I graduated wow. from college at 21. Mm -hmm. But it probably took me, you know, through much counseling, even starting as a teenager, and much counseling and much you know, just living life, you know, just bumping your head in the walls because I don't have no direction or no guidance. In fact, with, with everybody was getting the care packages from their mothers and they're hiding from their mamas and I'm sitting there wow. bad as hell. I could do anything, yeah. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I'm the one sitting there, right, trying to do the right thing as I'm yeah. trying to follow this script that right. I think my mother would want to write, but hell, I'd done it all. So, yeah. you know, but, and they're just sneaking home, right? Yeah. I just finally uh, took one of my aunts and I said, you know what? I had a real breakdown at one point. I said, I called my aunt. I said, well, just, will you just act like my mother and send me something? Wow. Similar to that guy. I said, would you just act like it? Mm -hmm. Just act like you like me and that you're proud of me. Will you send me something? Yeah. Yeah. And she did. She sent me something. And then from then on out, I think once a month, she tried to send me $50 mm -hmm. or something like that. And uh, from that re re experience, we became good friends, mm -hmm. uh, my aunt and I, until she died, and, and, which was she just died last year. But until she died, we kind of become kind of surrogates to each other because her daughter had died the same year mm -hmm. my mother died. So so okay. she wasn't, I didn't live with her, you know, primarily. So, you know, you do have to find substitutes mm -hmm. for what you want. And when people are hurting, they act out, they're yeah, angry because yeah. mm -hmm. there's a lot of anger. It's like, why don't I have what everybody so, else has, right. uh, whatever that is. So I can relate to that guy's pain because he wrote about it. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. He wrote about it and I, and I understand it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I spent so many, so many years helping my clients. Mm -hmm. um, I did 12 years of just court appointments. You knew me I when I just that. do court appointments. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I built a big practice from mm -hmm. it because I actually cared. Yeah. And I did I a lot of things I that they, I didn't get paid for. Yeah, so from that, my reputation mm -hmm. grew as a fighting lawyer. But you know, you knew me. Then. Oh yeah, oh yeah. She, Vivian from would the 90s, advocate. You know? I can see her right now. 
back in the wholesale, making deals for everybody. Yeah. Come on, Chloe. Come on, Chloe. Oh, yeah, he's got Chloe. <laughs> his nickname, his uh, uh, probation title was court liaison officer, so they, uh, everybody called him Chloe. Yeah. The, the initials. But she would make it happen for the clients. And, and I had a great career, no regrets with the county. One thing I really enjoy about the work I do now, I see, we see, mm -hmm. real life transformations occurring mm -hmm. every day. And I know, you, you know, so since you put it out there, I'm going to ride on that. I'm going to ride on it, it. You know, I give all praise to God, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. You got because to. You got to. But I'm not preaching to people over there, but we're doing ministry work. And I, ministry. we tell staff, hey, we're doing God's work here. And ministry is, comes in a lot of forms. A lot of forms. It comes in a lot of forms. Yeah. It's, it's, these are his sheep, too. Mm -hmm. Let you know? me just say it was fascinating <clears throat> to me uh, because I'm not from Houston, so mm -hmm. nobody knows me other than the work I've done. Mm -hmm. I came here to go to college. Mm -hmm. I was uh, at my house and a guy came over to put some, uh, a TV up. Uh, uh, my now husband, I've got mm -hmm. married. My, uh, now Congratulations. Husband, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, had somebody putting something up and the guy said, is that Vivian King? And I've never seen this guy before. Like, oh, she's famous. She was a famous lawyer. That's but right. so many people that I helped that are right. like nobodies to the world, yeah. I know that they, I had an impact mm -hmm. on their lives. You they know what I mean? It. And it was like my ministry. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it really yeah. was. And I wasn't asking for anything. I wasn't telling anybody that. But it was what I felt I had right. to do. So. I remember, if you want to take a guilty plea, you want to plead guilty? Mm -hmm. I'd get off the case. No, no, no. If they weren't guilty, and, and I got even worse as I got mm -hmm. older and more experienced. Oh, I could have had you. Oh, no, no. Yeah, if you if you told me you weren't guilty, yeah. and 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 that was when it was tough Republican judges, so mm -hmm. they weren't liking yeah. this because I'm getting appointed to right. it. So I'm one of the few people fighting the system. And yeah. fight. no, I'm not. If you told me you're not guilty, I'm not pleading you out. So you're gonna have to let me withdraw and get somebody else. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't right. do it. I remember that. I wouldn't mm -hmm. do it. Oh, yes. oh, I wouldn't oh, do it. Like no, I wouldn't do it. And I fight like hell for him. He was doing misdemeanors at the time. I would do some misdemeanors, but I also did a lot of felonies too. And capitals. And capitals and things like that. Oh yeah, no, I I rode with it. And if you, I don't care what the stakes were. If you said you didn't do it. We were all, yeah. You, I'm not gonna fool with you. Yeah. I'm not gonna plead you. You're not gonna. Yeah. You're not gonna. I mean, you know, if you sometimes you do because they might be kind of mm. guilty or they were scared or the deal was too right. good to be true. I might do something like that, but I'm not gonna plead anybody to some real time with some stuff they didn't right. do and especially right. misdemeanors. We, James, do you remember the time? I don't know because I know Jean, Judge Hughes will remember this, but if you remember the time, I don't know if you were in court that day because a lot of times when the trial started, you know, James was over there working with the probationers yeah. in another room getting them straight. But there was a guy one time. I mean, he was a, a low life guy and he said he didn't do it and he was a habitual and he said I said well tell the story in pictures mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that but Gene remembers it so you probably were doing your thing right. in another room but this guy who just looked like a, a street urchin Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Came to court with his truck because I wouldn't let him plead either. Yeah. And so he's got to stay in jail a whole long time because yeah. he got to get to a trial, right? Yeah. And this is court appointed. He got there and he had taken, what's those things in, in jail, in Harris County Jail, where I, they used to have them little handkerchiefs or, yeah, or yeah, papers yeah, yeah. or so, something. So where you can draw, draw and stuff. Yeah. He drew something that it, it probably was 20 feet by the time, I don't know how he had got strewn them all together, <laughs> but he told the whole story. It was almost like if it was drawn and it was a cartoon and you would have wow. done it fast, mm -hmm. it would have it would have been a movie. Wow. He drew, he unfolded this thing and, and told the whole story. And I, it was a court trial. Jean found him not guilty. She, and she still remembers <laughs> that. It was fascinating. No, it was fascinating. Yeah. So you just, you'd be surprised what talents people yeah. have. This guy was yeah. a talented artist. You would have thought he was a street urchin. Mm. You would just thought he was just like a wow. scum of the earth. He told his story in pictures. Mm. Oh, it's one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. Because he was like a great artist. He was Michelangelo. Mm. He had written every scene. Wow. He had drawn every scene. So I was one of like the the brightest moments or the like the best moments. Well, it was just it was just to show you that just like James was saying, people have talents you don't know anything about. You know, you just you would never. And what? Why did God or some, a voice tell me to tell him to draw it out? Wow. You, you understand what I'm saying? I didn't know he could draw. I just said it was a complicated story because it started with a traffic stop and you know so he was having to draw cars and things like that but as he did it it told the whole story every every it was a frame from a movie he did that and I just said well can you draw it out I'll give you some paper he came to court with these napkins <laughs> and you know how they have that 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 those dark black pens right, that they write draw. Right. He had drawn the whole thing and it just kept unfolding. It was it was fascinating. She reminded me about it a couple of years yeah, she, ago. Mm -hmm. I, this happened about, about twenty years ago. Wow. See, a, a guilty person. It's like a person who's guilty, they're not going to go to that extent mm -hmm. to do something like that. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I don't know how much time we have left, but I just want to clarify some things to so make clear. Okay, 10 minutes, great. Uh, we serve 
any person who's been touched by the criminal justice system, whether you spent one day in the county jail, 25 years in prison, you got out last night, you got out last week. Mm -hmm. If you're between the age of 18 and 70, a human being, mm -hmm. we will serve you. The vocational training for this funding source is for those individuals being released from either a Texas state jail or the penitentiary from Texas mm -hmm. within the last three years. Mm -hmm. Now we serve anybody right. uh, who's been touched by the criminal justice system, but as far as for this, this specific funding stream, the money specifically for those being released from Texas Department of Corrections uh, Institutional Division or a state jail facility within the last three years. Yes. But so, but if, so to add to that though, if they say been out five years mm -hmm. and they come to you and they do the 12 week program, you can refer them then to Sir Jobs or Absolutely. Texas Workforce Absolutely. or other programs yes. that are available. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Because they have different funding streams as well. Yeah, so now we have two uh, DOL programs. So <clears throat> we just got one, so I switched What's over that? to Career Coach. So the Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. So we have $1.5 million for 18 to 24 year olds to help them. And there are up to 200 different um, cert certifications mm -hmm. that we can either pay for or they can go through the, 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 the trainings at SARE. Um, and then we have 25 and up. And so theirs is being able to be out within the last two years mm -hmm. or still on probation or parole. That's the basis of it. Mm -hmm. um, so we can either pay for training. Like one guy we just sent, um, he's in the federal custody at Lydell. Um, so we sent him to uh, Houston Community College for CDL training mm -hmm. instead of sending them through the SEP program. Right. Because we learned the clients at Lydell, they have a lot of trainings because it's a federal facility. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of Where training. Is that at? It's downtown somewhere. I don't know. Texas or the one on Texas? Commerce. 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 Oh, yeah. Commerce. That's a yeah. federal facility? The, yes. the federal the federal that. halfway house. Oh, it's a halfway house. Yeah, right. so federal halfway house. So because these particular clients have fines and they have more classes they have to go to mm -hmm. um, to adhere to their parole stipulations, we have to adjust the way that we work with them. We can you can't work with them the same way that you work with a TDCJ. Right. Um, somebody's been released from TDCJ. So basically, we have these two different programs. We still have the city of Houston um, mm -hmm. being released from three years. So basically, we have three reentry programs mm -hmm. uh, at SARE. And if you haven't, um, if you haven't been incarcerated, great, because we want to reward you too. We have other funding mm -hmm. that we. We can help send uh, especially veterans or youth through other funding if you haven't been released. So we're working to serve not only the workforce development, but we're also moving to be a financial opportunity center as well. So helping those that need help with their credit and just to learn how to budget and do other things as well. Good. That's really good. That's mm -hmm. a good program. And the reason I kind of snickered a little bit uh, when you said we want to reward those as well, mm -hmm. I have staff who actually go to different locations, whether it's uh, the Texas work, work source location uh, at any branch here in Harris County. And what would happen is that they would make an announcement that we have a representative from the city of Houston Community Reentry Network Program. If you, you know, you have some barriers, you want to talk to them, they in room E, for example. And so a lot of people start coming in there. And so when I start doing the little screening process and everything, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, ma'am, but uh, do you have a criminal background? Oh, I've never been arrested before in my life. Well. I'm looking, I'm here to serve those who've been arrested. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean tell me I got to catch exactly. a felony? Exactly. Catch a, to get some help. <laughs> exactly. I said, no, oh, ma'am, that's not what I'm telling you at all. <laughs> I said, ma'am, if you look outside that door, there are 40 caseworkers there. They there, they here to serve individuals who's never been arrested before. Mm -hmm. It's only me here. Mm -hmm. I'm here to serve those who have been arrested. Don't you think they're entitled to some help, too? Mm -hmm. Well, since you put it that way, yes, sir. All right, yeah. James always had that gift of gab. He knows what's going on. I'm leaning in. I'm leaning in. Don't you think they need it? Don't you think? Yeah, I know. I know. Pull on those emotions. Those are hard to make. But don't you think they deserve a yeah. second chance, too? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, you're right. Matter of fact, my nephew, can he? Absolutely. Exactly. That's what it turns to. Exactly. My nephew, my mother, that's what exactly it's going to turn to pretty much every time. Every time? Yeah. Every time? Yeah. My, my church member, somebody at the church just got out. Yes. Yep. Every single time. They know it, it's just because the population, 15,000 people parole or come to Houston every year every that year. has been affected by the justice system. Right. 15,000. That's a thousand a month. That's not including federal. Exactly. That's not including federal. Right. So that's just TDCJ. That's Houston. 15,000 right. come to Houston every year from, or released to, to, wow. to Houston from TDCJ every year. That's a lot. So that's, 
I mean, yes. it's, it's a lot of work to be done. They're being released, and they're being released primarily at that northeast corridor. That's why we're strategically placed where we are, mm -hmm. 4802 Lockwood, because most of the ones that's being released are being released into mm -hmm. those zip codes. And we want to serve them. Mm -hmm. We know there are individuals that's on the south side, east side, west side. We, we would love to grow where we can have a... Uh, we can replicate the model in Kashmir and all these other sectors of uh, of the city because the, the need is there. And I would tell, I take these flyers with these brochures with me everywhere I go. And uh, I say, hey, it may not be for you. Mm -hmm. but it may be for someone you yeah. know. Because we all know somebody, Junior, mm -hmm. you know, Junebug, Ray, <laughs> Michelle, Michael, yeah. uh, Philippe. We all know somebody who's been touched by the system. And a lot of times there's some shame mm -hmm. and there's some embarrassment. I remember Vivian uh, working in court when I would cover a felony court. Mm -hmm. And I can always tell the scream of someone who's been sentenced to 40 years, mm -hmm. 20 years. It's just that, that scream from that grandmother. Mm -hmm. And they're sitting there and they're rocking. Mm -hmm. and, they, and I could wonder what must be going through their mind. It seemed like yesterday, uh, he was stepping on my toes. Mm -hmm. Now he just crushed my heart. Mm -hmm. And the question they asked themselves is, where did I go wrong? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you did everything you could, mm -hmm. right? So the bottom line is that I want that grandmother to know because everybody else may turn their back on the person that's incarcerated. Grandma, mm -hmm. mama, somebody's going to be there with those arms mm -hmm. wide open. They need to know that's a program in a city like Houston, as large and diverse as we are and spread out as we are, there's a city, there's a program that we will open our arms wide and we're going to serve those who come to us. And we have partners. If there's something that we don't have that we can't provide, then we have other partners who can provide that service. But nobody's no, it's not, they're not going to leave that center without help, mm -hmm. some type of help. That's what we do. And I said it too. So I'll say too, on, on behalf of Sarah, mm -hmm. not only a great partner, you're a great leader. Um, you. And what you've been doing and what the Renji program has been doing for the last, what's that, nine, yes. ten years or so, uh, probably more than that. But the, the things that you guys do are innovative and it spurns us mm -hmm. in the nonprofit and the workforce development uh, world to kind of get on our game more. I've seen not only the phone calls, right. not only the emails, but just your presence. Mm -hmm. uh, I've mentioned that James Bell went into a uh, prison. I know you went into prison. Yeah. What were we at uh, Tuesday? We were at Larry Getz uh, because mm -hmm. of what you did. It was something that I suggested that Sarah should do, but because I said James Bell is in prison yeah. uh, recruiting. We, we, we've been in three prisons since then. Praise God. So again, it's not only your leadership, but it's your example as well. And, and again, I'm one person. Mm -hmm. I have a staff of 11. I have a great manager and my division manager. Mm -hmm. manager. Uh, we have a great manager and our deputy director, Latasha Selectman, Deborah Moore, and Steve Williams. And at the top is the mayor. And again, they just give us the freedom. Mm -hmm. Here's the need. Go serve. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, I'm getting the little uh, <laughs> knock on the door to wrap it up. Can you believe this hour went by so quickly? It's been an hour? Uh, no. So so glad that you were able, James, to take off your yes. afternoon and volunteer yes. your time to tell the, the community. We'll have this show on uh, YouTube uh, and just Google their names, James Bell, Vivian King, and uh, Damian Walker yes. will be there. And you can find out about jobs. You can refer people uh, to their programs four jobs for the recently incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, sorry, recently uh, paroled. Yes. Uh, and these programs are even for people on parole. So that's the good news because mm -hmm. you were on parole. Weren't I was you? on parole. Yeah. yeah, you were still on parole. So thank you so much for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Thank you for listening and thank you guys for helping me educate people about the criminal justice yeah. system. Thanks for having me. Good night.